meaning to life and death is the purpose of life uh, is a very deeply rooted philosophy that, that uh, re really had no choice but to adopt because we had no alternative. Do you think it's an underlying drive of what you do? The reason you create a technology, the reason you think about the technology and the future of it and life extension? Well, life extension is one interest. I mean, I, I, you know, I started uh, this forecasting of technology trends for a practical reason, because I realized that timing was key to being in successful as an inventor. And most inventions, or most inventors fail, not because they can't get the thing to work, but because the timing is wrong. And the market isn't ready, that not, not all the enabling factors are in place when they need to be. And realizing that 30 years ago, I began as, as an engineer to collect a lot of data and build mathematical models. And I saw they were tracking quite accurately. And I developed this whole theory. And it's, I'm not just saying this now, saying this now looking backwards and overfitting for past data. I've been making these forward-looking predictions for a long time. And what falls, and I use this actually to time my inventions, this pocket-sized reading machine for the blind. I had a conversation with the National Federation of the Blind four years ago. And projected that this would be feasible in four years and it would take four years to develop and therefore we should get started back then, uh, whereas other companies are starting now because they realize it's feasible. So anticipating where technology will be is, uh, is important to being as successful as an inventor. But it does enable us to, s to look out 10 years or 20 years and see what the world will be like. And what I see is actually quite uh, attractive. We'll be able to greatly expand our appreciation and creation of knowledge and overcome profound problems. And uh, it's a future I want to see. So that actually motivates me to want to stay in good shape uh, to get there. So I'm not just interested in hanging on. Uh, I'm not just interested in radical life extension. I'm also interested in radical life expansion as we continue to expand our physical and mental capabilities by enhancing them with our creations. Before we leave this, uh, about your program you talked about, I read about the number of supplements you take on a daily basis. How, how many are those? Uh, it's running right now about 250. Uh, and that's the current state of the technology. I mean, I'm really reprogramming my biochemistry. And I'm not flying without an instrument panel. I mean, I take 50, 60 different blood tests periodically uh, to see, uh, you know, aside from just things like cholesterol and homocysteine and triglycerides, I mean, I, I measure a lot of different things. And constantly adjusting the program, but you know, according to every possible way we can measure these things, I'm staying quite healthy and and, and not aging uh, significantly in all these different ways, hormone levels and nutrient levels and and so on. Uh, but we have to be aggressive today to reprogram our biochemistry. This is the state of the art right now. I mean, we weren't evolved to live at our ages. I mean, human life expectancy was 25 a thousand years ago. It was not in the interest of species for people to live past child rearing. And that meant like age 25. Was, as I mentioned, it was 37 and 1800. So we really need to reprogram our biochemistry to slow down and turn off these aging disease processes. And this is the way we can do it today. It's an individualized program. You see what your issues are and how aggressive you want to be and how many different types of uh, body systems you want to enhance and, and keep at peak performance. And so I'm trying to do that for myself. It will get easier. 15 years from now, we really will have much more powerful drugs that can reprogram biology at a fundamental level. And so relatively easily, we'll be able to slow down these aging and disease processes. But bridge one, if you want to apply it aggressively, is not a uh, <coughs> one-trick pony. First, uh, Ray Kurzweil, San Diego. Yes, uh, I have a traumatic brain injury that severely affects uh, short-term memory and <coughs> frontal lobe executive functions, which speak to your pattern recognition. And <coughs> I, I ha uh, had a thought, uh, uh, I agree, I sort of ennoble the rationalization that uh, it's character building for me to uh, 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 you know, um, learn from suffering. And uh, I've personally gotten over suffering from suffering from. Uh, but I thought with your work with Stevie Wonder, and I look at movies like Forrest Gump and Rain Man, where uh, p 
the people around the supposedly disabled person are transformed out of their relationship with someone. And like with uh, stem cells and stuff, you can see the temptation for genetic engineering to eliminate abnormalities out of society. And I wonder, is it a total rationalization that something we call being human would be lost if we use nanotechnology and that stuff to perfect humans and to eliminate all suffering? Caller, thanks. Well, I think you make a very good point of distinguishing between uh, a defect and a, quote, abnormality that ra might really be a different way of relating to the world that is uh, profound and creative uh, in its own way. And uh, we do find, for example, in autism that uh, people have uh, limitations in certain types of communication, but these individuals can pursue knowledge and have skills that other people can't have and are really relating to the world in a different way. Uh, I agree that there are different ways to relate to the world, and we're not all the same. Uh, and, you know, there's no such thing as normal human behavior. What's normal uh, human musical ability? Was it the guy in my hotel room this morning who was whistling a song, or is it Beethoven or the Beatles? There's a broad range, and as we get to the h higher ranges of human capability, they become quite unique, and perhaps iconoclastic, uh, as you point out. Uh, I actually think as we enhance our, our minds by getting closer to our technology, we're not going to become all the same. We're going to actually become more different. We're actually fairly similar today. There's less genetic diversity among all humans than in one troop of baboons. Uh, we all have a brain that's organized the same way with the same regions and the same kinds of basic architecture, and it's constrained by a skull. And we can change our brain in certain ways, a certain amount of plasticity, but there's limitations on how far we can go with it. When we can actually break out of our skulls conceptually by enhancing our, tech, our, our thinking uh, beyond 100 billion slow neurons, uh, we'll actually be able to pursue different ways of thinking, different ways of creating that are very unique. And someone could really pursue you know, profound new forms of music in ways that wouldn't be feasible before. And someone else might you know, pursue history and get new insights that would be impossible today because they could master a lot more knowledge. And we'll actually become more different. And I think that actually would be a good thing. The, an email asks, if our technology keeps advancing, isn't the real problem in distributing it effectively and making it cost reasonable? OK, another good question. And one implication of the law of uh, accelerating returns is a 50% deflation rate. And you can see that clearly in electronics. You can get the same capability for half the money a year later. And generally, technology, particularly the kinds of technology that individuals use, follow a, cer a certain path. And when it comes out, it's unaffordable. Only the wealthy can afford it. But at that point, it actually doesn't work very well. And a few years later, it works a little bit, and it's merely expensive. And then it becomes inexpensive and actually is perfected and has a lot of new features and is very capable. And then ultimately, it's almost free and is very ubiquitous, and you can see that with the cell phone. Uh, you know, take societies in Asia where 15 years ago they had primitive agrarian economies and most people were pushing a plow, and today they have thriving information economies. That lag from early adoption of extremely expensive technologies uh, to a version that's very inexpensive and very ubiquitous and very almost free is 10 years. But that's going to accelerate. There's a paradigm shift rate that doubles every decade, so 10 years from now, That'll be a five-year lag. And 20 years from now, that'll be a two- or three-year lag. So these technologies ultimately become very ubiquitous. When we have full-scale nanotechnology, molecular nanotechnology assembly, and tabletop replicators that can use massively parallel information processes to create uh, macro objects, but building them at the molecular level by reorganizing very inexpensive input materials, we'll be able to create, really, from just information and very inexpensive input materials, most of the things we need, from clothing and food to computers. And basically, information will be the only thing that has value. We're moving you know, gradually to where the information component of the value of products and services is asymptoting to 
So the point is that these technologies ultimately become very widespread. I mean, think back 15 years ago, someone took out a mobile phone in a movie. That was your signal from the director that this was a very important person because only the wealthy and powerful could have a mobile phone. And they didn't work very well. And you don't have to be a powerful person now to have a mobile phone. Consider, the, consider making uh, intellectual creations. You used, you used to have to be a big Hollywood studio to create a movie. Well, now with your $500 camera and your PC, you can actually create a full quality Hollywood motion picture. And successful uh, motion pictures have been done that way. Or, or a recorded album. You don't have to be a r big recording uh, label. Or a couple of kids at Stanford, they were just with their $1,000 PCs or a piece of software. Today it's worth $100 billion and you use it to search the internet. Uh, so the tools of cre creativity are now widely, are now very widespread. They cost hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars, not millions of dollars. You don't have to be a big you know, organization to, to make these intellectual creations anymore. Scranton, Pennsylvania. Yeah, doctor, uh, a few years back I, I asked you on a radio show uh, whether there was a device that you could hook up to a synthesizer and where you could whistle or hum or a melody and have that device transfer to the synthesizer and have it play it out through the synthesizer. And you put me onto a device called a pitch tracker. Mm -hmm. Now, I wonder, is there any, this was a few years back, I wonder, is there anything out there that's uh, maybe uh, beyond the pitch tracker that you're aware of, or is the pitch, pr uh, pitch tracker still the way to go? Well, a pitch pr tracker is the way to go if, if you're trying to do what you describe, of, of sing turning your own voice and singing into... Uh, another type of instrument, uh, although that'll just track the pitch. Uh, in this little clip that was played uh, about uh, 45 minutes ago of, of my Ramona project, we transferred my voice into another voice, into Ramona's voice, and that was more than just changing the pitch because a woman's voice has completely different characteristics, and if you just change the pitch, it would, it would you know, it'd have the munchkin effect. It'd sound like a little chipmunk and not like a woman. Uh, so that actually was more complex of breaking that down into its components and changing each one of the components separately. And uh, that gets into multi-pitch trackers where, let's say, somebody's playing a piano or a guitar, which has mu many notes at the same time, being able to track all of those at the same time. And uh, that's a more com complicated problem, and they're making uh, advances on that. Uh, Hyundai, the big Korean car company just bought Kurzweil Music Systems and I'll be working with them on a new generation of musical instruments that will use some new advanced synthesis techniques so that we can create, if we want to just recreate the piano or the violin or orchestral instruments, we can do that, but that's already well established, but we'll be able to create uh, instruments that are just as satisfying and complex and rich and deep as these acoustic instruments, but that have no, but are things that we've never heard before. Uh, so there's many different ways in which we can use our understanding of the psychology of music and our, and our pattern recognition as applied to musical sound to create a whole new world of very s musically satisfying sounds and sound responses, uh, but that are, are synthetic and, and things that we've never heard before. An email I ask, who are your favorite songwriters and composers, and what do you consider the best piece of music ever written? Uh, well, my favorite classical composer is Beethoven. Uh, actually, if you listen to his uh, late sonatas, like the 31st and 32nd sonata, which is well past the point when he was deaf, uh, they're very jazzy. And they really remind me of contemporary jazz. They're not played that often, but I suggest people listen to them. So he really went off in his mind in a very futuristic way and anticipated a lot of trends in in music. It, it really has a modern 20th century Afro-American sound to it. It's, um, it's pretty remarkable. Uh, contemporary music, uh, the groups that are still popular were popular when I was a college student. So there's these 60s groups like uh, the Beatles and Rolling Stones are, uh, are still quite remarkable. Uh, the R Rolling Stones are remarkable because they've stayed together for 40 years. Uh, the Beatles are interesting in that you know, usually creativity is one person. Maybe there's other people supporting them. Uh, but here you actually have a group that was brilliant as a foursome. And not even a twosome, but a foursome. And uh, all those individuals, when they went off on their own, 
uh, made interesting music, but nothing like the brilliance of, of that collaboration.